So what they wanted to see in here was resistant changes, eh? So you do it with your finger in a sequence of, uh, you start with your fist, and you push, I guess it... I, the way I've been explained, it's supposed to be 10 kilo newtons of pressure, but I don't know what the hell that is. That's so, 10 kilograms. Yeah, so I, I was told, push on your nose till it starts to hurt. That's about what your, your resistance. So you start with your fist, and you just give it a little push on the surface. So the fist is the is the is the first resistance step you're you're looking for, and then you work your way down the snowpack. So now it's a little harder to push. I'm pushing out my nose, kind of starting to hurt. Switch to four fingers. Work your way down the snowpack till you feel resistant changes. Oh, it starts to go there. Push on your nose. Remember what that feels like. Then from four fingers, one finger. Till you start feeling resistant changes and it's slowly getting a little stiffer. Now you take a pencil and you poke a pencil through the snow. But I, through experience, just do it with my finger because I know what the pencil resistant change is. So then you just keep going down. If you hit an ice layer, you take a knife and stick a knife in there. So there's the different steps from fist, forefinger, one finger, pencil, knife. And you're looking for the snowpack to strengthen, to get more resistance as you go down the bottom. It's an indication of strength. That's a good thing. So then I'm going with my pencil. I get down here, it goes right through. In all of this uncohesive, loose, sugary snow at the bottom of the snowpack. So what, what hardness is that? So that's gone back to maybe four fingers. But it's it's not bad. It it means that the snow is sitting the whole snowpack down here close to the ground is very weak at the base. So it's got a basal instability. It has a potential for a deep slab problem. Remember when I showed you the picture of the compaction work up there? So this, what I find here, I don't have up there because I beat the shit out of it when it formed. I skied all over it and boot packed it. So that's our method of compaction. That's why we do it. So we don't have a deep slab instability. Deep slab instabilities, they're hard to trigger because they're so low down Think of skiing this slope with this deep slab instability. How much stress as a skier or boarder are you putting on it each turn? Probably not a hell of a lot. If it was a mid-pack instability like that, yeah, maybe be careful. <laughs> so it's not such a bad thing. It's not really bad. It's not really good, but it's it's there. So you'd be aware of it when you're skiing the back country. So I did say though, it's hard to stress that with a ski turn or a snowboard turn unless you go over a rock. So you can just imagine that deep instability on a rock is closer to the surface, that's a common trigger point. As soon as you turn around a rock, maybe by a tree, over a convexity, somewhere where it might be shallower, <coughs> now you hit the sweet spot. Now you got the whole slope propagates, it has the ability to propagate wide and keep going, now you got a big avalanche <laughs> at a meter and a half deep. Now you're toast. <coughs> That's kind of how it works. We just forecasted our avalanche problem here, right there. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to test the snowpack with uh, a compression test. So you use a shovel. It's a certain dimension, but it's very close to the same size as your shovel blade. <coughs> so in the back country, you just use your shovel blade to, use to, to measure. So then I got to isolate a column of snow in my profile so it almost, I'm creating a little bit avalanche path in a controlled situation, and I'm gonna test that avalanche path. There's other tests you could use as well, but this is fast and quick and easy.
So now I got three sides isolated. Now I'm going to isolate the back. So by cutting in there and isolating the back, I've already done one loading step. If, some, if this block fails at a certain depth, when you're cutting it, it means it's kind of got an unstable layer in it. Remember that a compression test really, it, it identifies where a weak layer might be. It doesn't really give you an overview of its ability to propagate wide. There's other tests you gotta do. This is just telling you where the unstable layer might lie. Then you just take your shovel, put it on the top of the column, and you're going to do 10 taps from the wrist. That's all I got. And you watch for failures. Now you do 10 taps from the elbow. Right there, you see that go? So now you take note of the character of that failure. So it was a sudden collapse type failure, which is another indication of this slab's ability to propagate wide. If the whole block slid off clean, it's called a sudden planer, uh, sudden, sudden planer failure. Those two characters are very important. In the United States, you call them Q1, Q2. It's the same thing though. It means exactly the same thing. So I did... I don't know, did I do my 10? I wasn't counting. One, one wrist. <laughs> so we got another one. And you also make note the depth of it, how many taps. So from the wrist is compression test, easy failure. From the elbows, moderate. Now I'm going to do 10 from the shoulder. I'm going to beat on this thing now. And if you want, you can take this off, take a look at the snow. It's really in the upper pack by my resistance changing down here. <laughs> All that is is just a storm snow failure. It's no big deal. At that depth, and I had a pretty easy result from the first couple of taps from my elbow, I'd still ski this slope. It would cause an avalanche maybe, but not a big one because it's only that deep. It'd be one of those power sloughing things you see in the movies. You just gotta keep turning out of it. And the way you control yourself in that, you, you turn four, and go one hard. Like four short, one hard. So you keep getting out of the power slough. So now we'll go 10 from the shoulder. And really beat on this sucker and look for failures. There it is. And you'd pull out your crystal screen, your loop take a look at the snow, identify the layer, and there's certain snow crystals that are more dangerous than others, but I'm looking at surface ore on it, just by looking at it. So, it's fairly deep. If that was on a big open slope, you might have a problem, but I had to hammer on that thing to get it to go. Would I ski this slope? Maybe, one at a time, ski cut it first, um, drop a tree bomb from the ridge line on the slope. The trees with, you know, we've got all these trees covered in snow up here. I shoulder check them a lot on the ridge lines and let the snow roll onto the snow slope. The back country, I picked up boulders. Just throw a rock on the slope, test it. Ski cut it. Find a similar slope with less consequence. Test that, ski cut it. So yeah, there we go. So it didn't fail down here where we have all this weak snow. Failed a little higher up with a different instability, a surface or instability and just from tracking my snowpack all season I know that that surface art because I watched it grow I watched it get buried I know exactly where it is all over the resort you know how thick that layer is uh, how thick the yeah. surface or layer yeah it's pretty small yeah. and it's starting over time because it's old yeah it's maturing and it's starting to bust down yeah. over just uh, pressure gradients new snow pressing down on it it starts to eventually disappear it takes a long time though. It takes yeah. about a month to mature surface water. Sometimes it never does. The bigger it is, and it what, how it forms is, it's kind of like winter dew on a cold, clear night. 
That's when the snow's all sparkly the next morning, that's surface war. On the surface, it's fine. It's fun to ski. It sounds like you're skiing through broken glass. Once buried, very dangerous. So there's only really two or three different crystal types you got to identify. The sugary stuff on the bottom, which is called faceting, or when it advances, it's called depth hoar. Surface hoar, which grows on a cold, clear night. So that's a no-brainer. You watch it grow. It grows above the snow rather than in the snow. And then you watch for crusts in the snow because crusts will also form facet layers. The sugary stuff <coughs> above or below the crust. It could be wind crust, it could be sun crust, it could be melt freeze crust. But crusts trap heat, latent heat. So now you've got a temperature gradient in the snow because there's heat trapped in the snowpack. And above or below, this happens. Was it up there? Does that make sense? You're all forecasters now. <laughs>